Well, today is April 3rd, 2016. My name is Kafat Malik, and I am in the Senior Physiologist Launch in the San Diego Convention Center during the annual meeting of the American Physiological Society. Today, I have the pleasure and the honor of interviewing Dr. Hiroko Nishimura for the Society's Living History Project. Dr. Nishimura has been a member of American Physiological Society since 1974. She is affiliated with the, the University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis and the Niigata University of Health and Welfare in Japan. Dr. Nishimura's research has focused on the neurohumoral mechanisms regulating blood pressure and kidney function. Hiroko, welcome to the Living History Project, and thank you for agreeing to be interviewed for this series. If you are ready, I would like to ask you a few questions about your career. First, I would like to express my thanks to APS uh, for inviting me to this the interesting uh, the session. And also, um, um, KU, I like, I like to say thank you uh, for taking the time for in giving me an interview. And um, although I feel very honored um, by being invited in this the, uh, the session, but the name Living History sounds like a little bit I'm getting a fossil. And our hope is that you will be prepared to ask, answer a few questions mm -hmm. about your career. I know that you were born in Tokyo, Japan, and grew up in Niigata City. Can you tell us what it was like growing up in Japan, both before and after the war? How did the war affect your education? Well, um, when I was born in 1937, the Japan and the China war just started. And when uh, World War II ended, I was only eight years old. So I really don't know pre-war period of Japan myself. I grown up during the war and post-war period. And I remember we are always hungry. And um, um, when the B-29 flew over the head, my mother turned off all the lights and it took us to underground shelter. And after the war, we are still very hungry, but we took it granted, because we are child, um, that is a life. So uh, we, we learned um, the democracy and also um, uh, the educational system, including English, that without no resistance. Can you tell us about your family upbringing mm -hmm. and how you became interested in science. Okay, um, my father was a journalist and also uh, he worked at the Japan-US press company. And during the war, he was um, um, invited to take a job in Niigata newspaper, daily newspaper company um, as a chief editor um, chief of the editorial section. So that's why we all moved to Niigata, and uh, actually we stayed there after. And my father was, um, uh, because journalist, he was quite liberal, and he allowed his children to um, um, select on uh, the life, on the, the job and the life. So I had no um, particular the, um, the order from my, my parents. So I was always interested in the biology and the science. So I wanted to be, go to the medical school. So um, also because of my father's job, I um, um, helped him for, as a secretary, as his uh, press, international press conference. And also we have um, exchange students American Field Service exchange students 
or Rotary International, the, the program. So I helped all those occasions. So that's like English, it's part, getting a part of my life. I know you received your MD degree in 1961 and your degree of medical sciences in 1968. Can you tell us about your decision to pursue a graduate degree after receiving your MD degree? Oh, um, I was always interested in the uh, basic science and medicine, but, um, and also the mechanism of disease. But when I finished the medical school, one of my senior, the medical doctor, internal medicine, told me, go first to um, clinical department and uh, they work with a patient. In that way, you can get the overall view of um, the um, uh, clinical science. And um, afterwards, if when you go to um, more basic research, you can always come back with the results back to the patient level and talk about the significance of the results. So I thought it is excellent, uh, the um, uh, suggestion. So I took uh, um, um, a kind of postgraduate the course, but it's not the graduate school at that time. It's just postgraduate fellowship for like four or five years. And um, uh, there are studies on uh, experimental hypertension. And then uh, I moved to uh, basic science. So my question is always from a more clinical side. Now you came to the United States, especially New York, specifically to New York in 1968. What contributed to your decision to leave Japan and come to work as a visiting instructor at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons? I always wanted to pursue my um, initial research training in the United States because uh, I know their basic science the level is excellent. So um, after I finished my graduate degree, uh, degree of medical science, I took um, a junior faculty job at Toho University, one of the medical schools in Tokyo. And there, I, um, the boss, uh, Professor Hirofumi Sokabe, is a um, uh, pioneer of comparative uh, renin angiotensin system. So I started to learn about the renin angiotensin system and hypertension. And at that time, the, remember the SHR um, found in Japan, it's just only fifth generation. It's very young days of the, hypoten the spontaneous hypertension that I worked on. So in the, um, I think 1968 or 69, we have a um, um, US-Japan uh, cooperative research program, which is sponsored by NSF, in US side and the Japan Society of Promotion of Science in the Japan side. And uh, there, uh, one of the participants was um, um, Dr. Wilbur H. Sawyer, uh, who is a professor of uh, pharmacology, Columbia University, PNS, physicians and surgeons. And he's the authority of uh, comparative uh, physiology and bio biochemistry of um, neurohypophysial hormone, not really renin angiotensin. But he was interested in uh, me, and uh, he asked me to come over to join his research. And um, he has a, or the Department of Pharmacology at that time has huge NIH program project grant, uh, physiological pharmacology, and it's critical application. <laughs> it's almost impossible right now, but uh, it's a very generous grant. And I was supported by that um, um, the program project for three years, and I stayed in New York. So in 1973, you joined the Department of Physiology at the mm -hmm. University of Tennessee Health Science Center in Memphis. Yes. So what contributed to your decision, and how did you contribute it, and how did you contribute I mean, contributed to the department, uh, Departments of Physiology Research and Teaching Program in Memphis. Oh, well, um, the, 
I meant originally going back to Japan and continue my the career after two, three years of uh, the fellowship. But at that time, my professor, Sokabe, um, the moved to other institution. And when the boss moved in the Japanese system, it was very difficult for a fellow to go back to our original you know, the department. So, and also Sokabe did not have a position for me in his new university department. So I looked for a job. I wrote uh, over 100 the letters and I got um, seven interviews and three job offers. That's great. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite generous at that time, as you know. And I, took, I selected the, the Tennessee, mainly because the specialty of uh, Dr. Leonard Scheer, who was a chairman at that time, is a neurohypophysial hormone. And he was a friend of uh, the Bill Sawyer. But you, so. Did you know Dr. Scheer before? Well, he came by uh, for seminar, the ones in the, the pharmacology department. So I met him briefly, and um, I was very impressed by his research of um, the release of uh, neurohypophysial hormones, a physio you know, physiological mechanism. So, um, and uh, thereafter, I was uh, always in, uh, in Tennessee. And um, he was actually the, a great uh, chairman. He supported the young faculty to gain uh, own research fund. And also he selected the faculty from a different area of physiology. Close enough, we can talk, but not compete with each other. So actually I have a great the, the colleague and uh, as you know, in the pharmacology, <laughs> next building, the chairman was, um, um, or not at that time, but a little later, yeah, later chairman on. was um, uh, Jack McKeith and uh, KU yourself and Tito Najuretti and others. We had a great group at that time. Yes, so I I, Yeah, I, I owe a lot of my career to my colleague. A lot of them were very close interaction, really. Yes, yes, it was a very nice group. How did your research area of expertise develop, and who were the people, you know, you influenced your career? Oh well, um, I mean, the, who influenced your own career? My original research, the, I mean, started as a hypertension as my uh, graduate school, and also um, that because of my professor Sukabe, I learned the uh, winning angiotensin system. But actually, I was very interested in. So I stay in the comparative physiology, uh, not only the renin and angiotensin, I um, learned the kidney, the transport, and hypertension and others. But um, that was uh, the main uh, the line of my research. And um, um, the um, renin and angiotensin system, I I was interested in the evolution you know, of the physiology and the biochemistry, how it's originally evolved, how it's changed uh, during, uh, along with the um, uh, phylogenetic scale. And that's, I thought, it will help to analyze more complicated mammalian system. But when I um, studied um, angiotensin effect in the kidney, in the fish tube, actually, uh, um, the kidney, I realized very little known in the um, physiology of the um, transport itself. So I studied, started the research a little bit of um, tubular transport in the lower bird rates, and mainly um, the fish and the birds. So that's it's kind of opened up my um, um, research area other than the, the, the um, System. Yeah, I remember you were the only one who could perfuse the tubules in the fish. <laughs> that's true. And later on in the chickens. Yes, that's right. I perfused uh, the old segments of the, the, the fish kidney and also the, the bird's kidney. It was very um, tedious work. Actually, I owe that technique to um, the Dr. Masashi Imai, who was... Um, um, 
initially the fellow of um, University of Texas, Yuha Koko's lab, but later on he was um, um, he became a um, professor and also the um, chancellor, vice chancellor of uh, Gigi Medical School. He is just, he has just a superb technique. And he showed me how to do in the rats, but I just apply uh, to fish. I forgot to tell you about the, my teaching, uh, yeah, you mentioned earlier. Uh, teaching, uh, in addition to research, of course, it's, it's a major job for faculty. Yeah. And it's always not easy <laughs> for foreign, particularly for me, foreign uh, yeah, teacher. So um, the, um, I taught the, the physio, uh, endocrine physiology. So that's not that difficult because I uh, was an MD, but the students complain about my Japanese accent. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to prepare a good uh, handout and some reading materials. And also um, I said, the students, don't complain my Japanese accent. Your future patient may be a Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> now, can you tell me, in your view, mm -hmm. what has been your most significant contribution to physiology? Well, that is a difficult question. Um, I think the evolution, biochemical and physiological evolution of renal angiotensin is uh, important to uh, the work uh, to contribute um, not only uh, comparative physiology, but uh, mammary and the renal angiotensin science as well. And also, um, 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 I um, studied uh, the transport mechanism in the lower birth race and uh, the birds, and the birds is Birds and the mammals, actually, they only, um, the bird race species clearly uh, could concentrate urine. And the birds, I found the birds already have very basic, uh, the uh, single effect counter current uh, mechanism. So and that is uh, quite a contribution, I hope. And actually, I have a featured topic tomorrow, the, the session. They asked me as one of the keynote speaker and talk about the counter current system and the aquapollin in, the, in the, the fish, which I will do tomorrow morning, 10.30. So also, um, the, um, I am um, interested in the high blood pressure of the birds because they were born normal tensor, but to increase rapidly high blood pressure when they are mature. And they develop uh, the vascular disease, actually spontaneous the, um, neointima, the, just very like the human. So I use as a model uh, for study the mechanism of uh, neointima development and the relation to high blood pressure. So those are, I think, yeah, I remember. I, <clears throat> I remember that was a very, very nice piece of work what you did. Thank you. Now you have been a professor emeritus since 2009 at the University of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. However, you have also returned to Nagata University of Health and Welfare as professor. Mm -hmm. Tell us how it has been to go home and what you are doing now in Nagata. Okay, um, I meant to return after I um, retired the University of Tennessee, but I really didn't mean to continue my work because when I left Japan, it was quite a man's world, basic, uh, particularly the medical science and uh, women have a little chance to be a um, um, particular prof professor or at a higher position. So I thought I pursue my career in the United States and that's it. But when I finished, I still have a lot of energy left. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, I could stay in the United States, but um, the, um, I, um, 
I, I took a green card, but I never changed my citizenship. I, I was still Japanese. So I decided to go home. And also my um, the husband, Dan, um, who unfortunately died three years ago, he insisted I should go back to Japan. Uh, he's actually the one who pushed me to go back to Japan because he likes Japan and also um, um, he feels safe, particularly yes. if he dies earlier and he leaves me alone in the um, United States, he's so afraid because of the security. So we went home. So I, um, uh, first I took a job as a specially assigned professor of the Niigata University Nephrology Institute, where I have several friends. And I, um, I got a small project, program project grant from the government. So I had a team and uh, worked for three years. Actually, it's a quite a new project I um, took. That is um, um, so-called fetal programming and using uh, the bird egg as a model. The fetal programming is only about this 20 years, as you know, getting popular. But the, in Japan, we have particularly the large number of uh, small, um, small birth weight children, low birth weight children. And later on, um, they became uh, hypertensive or diabetic or the nephrosclerosis, but the relation between those disease and um, the, the status of the low birth weight was not very clear. And uh, it was not very clear what is the mechanism for those, uh, the programming. And it's the same in this country and all advanced country actually, but the Japan is the highest. And I was always interested in the why that's a reason. So I started to work on the project using uh, the quail egg and take um, the part of the egg white the, from the egg and cause so, so like um, nu low nutrition in the, the egg and I let them hatch and the follow their growth. <clears throat> and also the, um, the kidney mainly, and what's the mechanism, what kind of the change they have, and what would be the mechanism. So actually, I'm still doing that work. It's, it's, it's a very important work because now, as you know, mm -hmm. in USA, mm -hmm. a couple of institutions, mm -hmm. particularly the University of Mississippi Jackson, mm -hmm. number of investigators really are looking, and other places, mm -hmm. and uh, how the restriction mm -hmm. in the blood flow mm -hmm. in the females, you know, can affect, impact the life of the child mm -hmm. and the growth rate, and also they develop hypertension. So it's a very interesting piece of work. Yeah, so that, you're right. The, um, yeah. the, um, actually, the Dr. Babala um, Alexander, she visited the, the couple of years ago, Japan, and I talked to her, or oh, I knew her before hence, but I talked to her on, her on this subject. And he gave us a subject, she gave us a subject, a seminar. And uh, yeah, yeah, yes, it's getting popular. But the problem is in Japan, and it could be in the US, um, the, we really don't know the social reason of why we have so many uh, low birth weight. Actually, in Japan, one out of 10 uh, the baby born small, less than 200, uh, 2,500 gram. So hopefully you will continue this work. Yes, okay. and um, the um, one reason because we have um, the mother's age getting higher. You know, it used to be 20, 25, 30, but now it's over 30 and 40. Maybe it's in the same as this country. So, and uh, this program, um, the fetal programming, uh, the placenta is very important. Okay, and, let me uh, ask you now, you have received a number of prestigious awards over the years. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about some of these awards? Okay, um, the, actually my first award is um, uh, Grace Pickford Award. Uh, she, is, she was a pioneer of a comparative, or actually all, overall, um, the, 
the, let's say, low bird rates work, particularly fish. And uh, so I feel very, and, and this award, um, second award was given to me, and I was very award, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I was very honored. And uh, this award was given directly the, uh, by her. So um, that's very nice. And also, I, APS um, August Crow Award, um, I was very honored, and uh, I gave a lecture, and uh, it was very nice. Um, the recent one is um, um, Niigata Nippo, a newspaper company award. Um, it's, they call it Culture Award. And um, I got, um, 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 let's see, the scholar, scholarly division award. And um, I, that was given the whole, whole career, not the special project. But they have a 60 years award history. Mm -hmm. And I was the first female to get this award in the, the um, um, Scala Division. Congratulations. Well, Great. thank you. But that means how Japan society is behind for women's activity. 60 yeah. years? Yes, yeah, 60 years. <laughs> so can you tell us about your first American Physiological Society meeting ah. and how it differs from the current meeting? Okay, that was an interesting question. Uh, my first APS conference actually was a fall conference, 1974, I think. Um, it was Kansas, Kansas, or Missouri, Kansas, I forgot which ones. But anyway, um, the, you, you remember the fall conference. Yes. It was uh, much smaller than this, and uh, everybody get friendly. Yes. And I first time I met the J.O. Davis at the conference. And also, actually, I met, uh, oh, I'm, I earlier than that, I, 1971, I think, actually. And I met Leonard Scheer again at that conference. And I- That was before you joined. Yes, before he, I joined. <laughs> and I, I, that was, at that time, the miniskirt was very popular. So <laughs> I, I came to the dinner with a very short the, the, the dress. The, and he looked at me like this. <laughs> he liked it very much. And I don't think that is the reason he took me. He hired me <laughs> his, his department. But um, that was before I became a fac his faculty. And actually, the, the um, EPS conference was very good at that time. But um, um, unfortunately, the fall conference was discontinued, uh, replaced by um, the APS conference, which is fine. But uh, the fall conference was good for uh, young people or students to present because it was easier, more at, at home. Yeah. Here, of course, this, the all over, I mean, the big uh, APS, um, I mean, FASEV, and also the EV conference. Well, it makes nice. sense because now we yeah. are more really integrated now. Yeah, true. Here but on the, uh, on the other hand, it's getting a, a little bit too huge. It's, it's hard to um, find out what's going on where. And um, sometimes simultaneous sessions, it's very apart the distance. So, about you know, APS grow. So tell me what role has APS played in your career? Well, um, that is the first to the scientific society I joined. And um, I owed, owed APS a lot, not on the um, August School lecture, but um, I always joined this kind of, uh, the APS meeting. Um, I only, particularly the uh, spring meeting, you know, when they were called FASEB first, in the Atlantic City, if you remember, and also um, the, after change yeah. to e, EB, experimental biology, I only missed it twice, and the others all I That's present. Excellent record. And, yeah, and also um, I served uh, the AJP Associate Editors for 12 years, and also um, I served many um, committee in the APS, so I like this society. 
and it's ideally appreciated. Very good. Now, while medicine and physiology can be considered your first career, mm -hmm. and I know that your second career has been dancing, can you tell us about the second career? Well, that is my favorite <laughs> subject, of course. Um, when I was child, I took um, dance lessons. These, at that time, there is no clear um, category in Japan, or Niigata, as a ballet school. So I took regular, the Western style dancing school about two years. And when um, I became a junior high school student, getting very busy for studying, for study, and it was not possible to continue both. And I liked dancing too much just to continue as a hobby. I was afraid um, any minute I stop going to school and then, <laughs> you know, seeking a career as a dancer. But at the same time, I look at my body and the figures, and uh, at that time, the, we grown up, the children grown up on tatami, the floor, so our leg is not straight, <laughs> and as a <laughs> tradition, leg is not uh, long enough. So I said, Hiroko gave up, I give up. <laughs> you not the be, uh, you can be maybe professional, but you never be, you know, real successful. So I con discontinued dancing completely because just as a hobby, you know, it, I do, liked it too much. And um, also I um, wanted to have a job, independent job. I don't want to live the, depending on the, the husband income. So I look for the medical career. It was quite a decision as a, the, about the 12 years old girl. But girl. Well, you did an excellent job in Memphis. Yeah. You became so, very famous, popular, and you married a guy who was your <laughs> dancing well, partner or actually, teacher? When I finished my um, internship and residency, and I think, okay, Hiroko, you can start. You have no way to change your career to be a pro you know, dancer. So I started to retake the ballet school in Tokyo and continue in New York and also the Tennessee. But in a sense, I made a mistake because after growing up, your body, your, your bone and the muscles are already too tight to change for ballet style. So I never advance more than the intermediate, to intermediate students, but I like it. And of course, you know, my um, the husband, Dan, is a professional dancer and also the teacher. So we did a show and um, I quite uh, until I uh, retire, or after, after retirement, I continue to, to do a show dance. So it was nice. Very good. Now, what advice would you give to students mm -hmm. that are starting out science today? Well, that is important, but it's a difficult question. It's just, uh, you know, could be just my own uh, that personal view. But I think to be a physiologist, to study whole body and organ system is very important particularly if you are interested in the mechanism of disease, as I did, you have to see the whole body uh, first. So, always, so that always your question starts from um, whole, uh, whole body or whole animal. And uh, even if you go down to a molecular or cell level, and you can interpret your results to back to um, the, um, the whole body. I think that is very important. So the, um, uh, that's one thing I really would like to young fellows to think. Not uh, right away go to uh, molecular science, which is more attractive and more easy to get funding these days. But don't forget to look at the organ and the whole physiology. So the, I have two reasons I, I um, started the, the comparative physiology. One is, as I mentioned earlier, 
I wanted to study evolution and uh, phylogenetic history and how it come to so complicated uh, the mammalian system. But the second reason is I think the comparative physiology provide a lot of use for animal models. And I, I actually, I worked on the very various animal models, which is um, a contribute to science. The, for example, like uh, I used uh, a glomerular fish, no, no the glomerulus, no, just the renal tubule, but they have plenty of the renin. And uh, so I, the, um, I studied the, the control of mechanism of renin release of that species. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the birds, particularly fowl, um, increase the blood pressure rapidly due with their maturation. And it's a good, good mechanism, I mean a good model for studying the hypertension and also the But the also I think disease. you would suggest the young generation uh, scientists, you know, to continue working on the whole animal because of its really implication directly to the, you know, humans. Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay. That is true. But um, you, you know the yeah. tendency is going, because uh, I was surprised the other day, the young fellow, they don't know even how to measure the blood pressure <laughs> in animals. <laughs> yeah, they're physiologists. Yeah, they are physiologists. So okay. I really encourage people to work on the whole body organ system physiology. Well, thank you very much for participating in the Society's Living History Program. I truly, really enjoyed this opportunity to learn a bit about you and your career. And thanks again. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for your time.